Hi, this is your host, Sapin Bhartia, and welcome to a special Let's Talk show for SL of Conf. And today we have with us once again, Kit Merker, Chief Growth Officer at Noble Line. Kit, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Swapno. Yeah, so we had a very, you know, you folks had great uh, solo con there. We recorded some interviews there as well. Talk a bit about any, you know, first of all, I would love to just hear, you know, uh, what was the experience this year? What kind of, you know, speakers or attendees were some, you were like, hey, you know what? This is what we're expecting. Or you're like, hey, we are not expecting that kind of audience. And we're kind of, you know, not only surprised, but in a positive way. Sure, yeah. I mean, there were lots of lots of great surprises at SlowConf this year. Um, this is our third year running the event, and you know we started right in the middle of COVID, and uh, we try to do something different from a virtual event perspective, um, which I think kind of surprised people. One is like we kind of throw out the agenda. There's no schedule really. We have this uh, daily stand up that I host, but it's a very short time. But the rest of it's all done uh, virtually and and um, asynchronously. So people submit their videos, and we can watch them and discuss them async. But one of the things we did this year that was different and a huge hit is we ran SlowConf local events all over the world. And we had uh, 10 different cities, including New York, uh, Chennai, Sydney, Australia, London, Dublin, Tokyo, um, you know, just, just all over the place. And those in-person events got really, really uh, rave reviews. So at those, they had local speakers, they had food and drinks, they got to watch a few videos, the pre-recorded. Um, we got really positive feedback about the local events and people want us to do more of that. And I think it was a very unique way for us to, you know, not bring everybody from all over the world to one city, but really to meet people uh, where they were. And I think that was a cool change this year. We had some great speakers from end practitioners. So companies like Capital One, um, the New York Times, uh, Ford Motor Company, people who are adopting SLOs uh, themselves and can share that story, not you know, not necessarily vendors pitching their their technology, but really kind of the end end user practitioners. We also saw, I'd say, an increase in the um, executive audience this year. We saw, uh, I think, it was over 160 people joined that had uh, VP or higher titles, uh, which I think is also a really nice turnout for an event with about 2,000 people uh, that showed up uh, for the event overall. Um, so yeah, so that, I think for this year, my big takeaway is. Um, the shift from, you know, should I do SLOs to how do I do SLOs and hearing from real practitioners that have seen the the, be the business benefits uh, of SLOs uh, in their organization. I think that's really the key thing. Did you folks make any announcement during this, you know, event week? Yeah, we we use uh, SlowConf week as our time to kind of dump a bunch of announcements. So I'll just give you the highlights real quick. So um, we started the week with uh, reviews from a couple of different analyst reports. So the state of SLOs. Uh, 2023 came out and uh, we had, uh, you know, that that we reviewed with Brian Singer last week at SlowConf. And then um, we also had Paul Nashawadi from the Enterprise Strategy Group who talked about his new report, uh, which is all about the business impact of service level objectives. You can find both those on our website on noblemind.com. Um, we also announced a bunch of product enhancements, uh, which are mostly focused, I think, you know, in the spirit of reliability engineering, focused on the reliability and quality of Noble9 itself. Um, so we built a, a query checker, we built a um, metrics health notifier, and basically a bunch of tools that make it so you're resilient to upstream data issues. When you're building SLOs, you're highly dependent on the data, and you may have heard this term uh, garbage in, garbage out. So we're trying to help people figure out you know, what garbage is coming into the SLO so they can improve upstream monitoring and, and that kind of stuff. We also announced that we're now available on Google Cloud Platform um, in addition to AWS. So now we're giving customers choice of where to deploy um, Noble9 itself across the clouds. Uh, but wait, there's more. We also <laughs> announced uh, a new uh, network, what we're calling the Noble9 Delivery Network. And we announced this with um, services companies that want to bring uh, open source methodologies for SLOs, so including OpenSLO, the Slow Development Lifecycle, or Slow DLC, uh, R9Y.dev, which is a reliability uh, kind of a, a architecture framework that Google created. Um, but we're working with companies like Cognizant and Coravant and vSceptor and Teleon and these other kind of very focused um, uh, professional services groups. Um, they are uh, working with us now as part of this delivery network. We have a set of services, including cloud migrations, SLO boot camps, even AI policy workshops. We have a bunch of different uh, reliability oriented um, services that people can find. We can connect you with partners. Uh, and, and service providers through this N9DN. So that's noble9.com slash N9DN, the Noble9 Delivery Network. And the final, and I think the most fun announcement is I got to work on a little project called SlowGPT, slowgpt.ai, which is a um, 
basically a way for you to quickly build SLOs using generative AI. And uh, it uses Google's new Vertex, uh, Palm 2, the preview of Palm 2, which just came out at Google I.O., what, two weeks ago? Um, and we showed that off last week. And the cool thing here is one of the challenges, like I was talking about the garbage in, garbage out problem, people have to connect to their data sources to get SLOs. You want to go get, you know, an SLI, you got to use, you know, Datadog or New Relic or Prometheus or whatever upstream tools, connecting to that, finding the data, getting the query, and then um, pulling it into an SLO platform is a lot of work. Well, SLO GPT makes it so you can use the universal API, which is a screenshot. So all you do is you take a screenshot of your uh, metrics we have some examples on the website, so you don't need to necessarily even, uh, you know, if you just want to try it out, you can do it without any setup. But um, it analyzes the data, pulls out uh, the uh, the SLI data, gives you an interactive SLI, lets you set different targets, let you set different thresholds, and you can see an L, uh, a burn down. Um, but what's really cool using the, um, the LLM, the large language model AI capability, is you can actually ask it questions about uh, the SLO. And so you might ask silly questions like, you know, write a song or write a poem about my SLO, which is kind of fun. And it'll tell you, if you, you know, something, uh, something funny, but you can also use it to generate open SLO YAML, for example, so you can, you can ask it for that. So you can have fit that into your, um, your developer workflow for SLOs. And we actually showed a demo of that at SloconF on the last day. Uh, Peter Patak, who's the developer who built SloGPT uh, along with me, you know, we worked on it together. But what's really cool is he showed how you can fit that into an actual workflow of you know, you have your metric in Datadog, you take a screenshot, you put it into slow GPT, it generates the YAML, then you can go into Noble9, connect it to the data source for real with a real query, add it to your GitOps workflow and apply it using the slow cuddle command line. Anyway, so that's, I mean, there's a whole rundown of stuff that happened this week from a news perspective, but, you know, everything from AI to, to delivery network to new capabilities to industry research, all of that kind of encapsulated in the, um, the slow conf week. Can you talk a bit about what well, you also mentioned a slow report? Uh, so talk about you know uh, if there was any anything that you know st st stood out or it was some major you know kind of point or highlight. Sure. Yeah. So this, the state of SLOs uh, survey 2023. This is the second year that we've run this, and what's what's really interesting about it, uh, what it indicates to me, um, my biggest thing. I mean, we could dig into the the data, and I, I definitely encourage people who want to go deeper to watch uh, Brian's. Uh, overview of it from SlowConf uh, day one, daily standup last week. But the one that surprised me the most is we asked the question, new question this year, um, did you increase your focus on reliability due to the pandemic? And 80% of the respondents said yes. And so this to me, you know, it's something we kind of felt, but having that validation that the pandemic actually increased people's focus on software reliability, I mean, that really rung true. The other interesting thing is we saw some of the data uh, being very consistent with the previous year. And when I talked to the research team that did it, you know, I was like a little bit depressed at first because like, oh, so nothing changed. And they said, no, no, this is actually a good thing because now it validates our sample um, because, you know, if we see the same percentage answers year over year with the different people answering the questions, it kind of validates that the, you know, the, the people we're talking to are really telling us the right thing. So we're seeing uh, in that, um, and I, you know, I don't have all the headline numbers off the top of my head, but, you know, definitely seeing the impact of, um, of SLOs on the business, uh, seeing people who are, are, you know, using SLOs and that trend is continuing to increase. Again, the, the, the big surprise to me was like, okay, they really are focused on this uh, as a result of the, the pandemic and what we've seen come out of that. And you're also talking about, uh, you touched upon, uh, there were a lot of, you know, folks, executives that, you know, you're like, kind of surprised to hear. And you also talk about that there are a lot of users, you know, not just vendors pitching their products and solutions. But I'm curious when uh, all these, you know, especially you mentioned some names as well. Uh, and of course, we talked about state of SLO, but where, when it comes to SLO, how much awareness did you see was already there uh, in terms of that, that you're like, hey, we have actually moved that phase as we have this discussion earlier also that the awareness phase is gone. Now it's more about, you know, actually helping them, you know, with their SLO strategies. Where are we? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the interesting thing, you know, I've been in this slow game, the SLO game for, you know, a few years now. And I, you know, Google did a great job of advocating for service level objectives as part of the SRE uh, methodology. But I think it was kind of seen as one part of something, you know, of this, this larger change. And you had to kind of question, okay, do I want to do SRE or not? And what we, we, we tried to do was to break out the really great parts about service level objectives. Um, and, and I think, you know, Steve McGee from Google did a nice talk about this at SlowComp actually, but he, he kind of talked about how Google's true innovation on SLOs, which have been around for a long time. I mean, SLAs and SLOs have been around for, for a long time, as long as there's been service. Their true innovation was how to apply SLOs to distributed systems. 
And the SLO methodology that you see is really about distributed systems. What we see is SLOs can be used in a variety of use cases. And so we've taken actually what Google was popularizing and we've, we've brought together practitioners that are finding all sorts of creative uses for SLOs um, that are not just about distributed systems, they're also about you know, how we measure you know, our inventories for our supply chain or um, how you know, client software works or even how monolithic software works. You can measure it through this concept of services. As companies are adopting the service uh, abstraction, and we see services everywhere, software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, uh, microservices, right? This is where the way people are thinking about the interactions of software now. Um, it only makes sense that you're going to find the reliability targets, performance targets, the, you know, the shape of that service um, in a way that can be consumed by other people. So, so to, to your question, you know, we when we started this, it was trying to get people excited about SLOs. Now what we're seeing is, well, first of all, it's called SLO comp for a reason. Like people self-select. They kind of already know what SLOs are before they join. I don't think many people join the conference not knowing what it is. And that's that's sort of by design. We want to have people who are, who are all part of this. But it definitely has gone from, you know, what is an SLO? What are the basics? What is an error budget? You know, these kind of very basic concepts that are important and, and counterintuitive, but they're, they're basic concepts. So now, how do I convince my boss? How do I show the business value? How do I um, decide whether to do DIY or open source or a vendor solution? How do I roll this out across my organization? And actually, it was interesting is in the exit survey, we did a post-event um, exit survey like we always do. But we asked people, what is the next step on your SLO journey? And we wanted to understand that. And we had a very small percentage, like 1% who said, I'm not sure I need SLOs. We had, a you know, a, I think about a quarter of them saying they want to um, they want to do their you know, first SLO, we want to create our first SLO, but the vast majority, like 70%, something like that, um, said they were either automating SLOs, air budget, slows as code, they want to do something like that, or they were trying to scale SLOs across their organization. So I, that to me is a very strong signal that people are ready to take this to the next level. It's not the getting started. Sure, there's people, you know, a quarter of the people are in the getting started camp, but the vast majority are now saying, okay, I've taken it, I've gotten started, but now I need to scale it. Now I need to automate it. Now I need to really, um, Get the to get the value out of it. So SLO is now in production and day two phase or day three, day four phase. Hundred percent, yeah. It, it, we're we're definitely past the toy phase. And I, I'm gonna be honest, like I've got customers like you know Ticketmaster and Cisco and ServiceNow and others uh, that and and Procore, you know, that are all really uh, taking SLOs as you know using Noble Nine as as like a production. You know, it's how they're getting alerts. It's how they're silencing alerts. If you look at the report from Enterprise Strategy Group. They talk about how OutSystems reduced their alerting by 92%. Noisy alerts reduced by 92%. And I just think about like the impact for engineering teams. And it's funny, I, you know, I talk to engineering teams all the time that, you know, we have monitoring over here and we have alerting over there and we can't figure out how to get it to tell us with high signal uh, and high quality what's going on. And I think if there's just one thing you can solve from S, you know, from, from SLOs, if you can get the pager to go off when it's supposed to and not go off when it's not, if you can get that solved, that's a very clear business value because, you know, I don't know, not waking people up at three in the morning, sure, you're not paying them at three in the morning in theory. I mean, we all, you know, most engineers are salaried, okay. But the fatigue and the hazard pay and the, you know, the impact on attention, that has a real uh, impact. And that means, you know, I don't, I don't like to talk about the cost savings part because I think that's less interesting. The, the more interesting thing is, how are you gonna have time to learn how to do AI and move to cloud and cut costs and, and and deliver new capabilities for customers if your team is chasing the pager? Like how as an organization are you gonna do that? I, I don't know. I, how do you become competent at data science and AI if your team is answering the pager from noisy alerts? It just doesn't seem like a strategically smart move. So that's that's my, I mean, that's my simplest pitch for why SLOs. Well, look, OutSystems reduce their paging by their uh, false alarms by ninety two percent. If you could do that to your organization, you could free up resources to work on AI and cool stuff. Okay, that's the simplest way I can explain uh, the value of SLOs. Yeah, these events also help us, you know, kind of you know shaping the future. So, what what were some key takeaways where you're like, hey, this is where users are or the ecosystem is, and that's where we should move forward. Which means, you know, what does it mean for Noble Line and yeah, yeah. So that's, that's a really great question. So one of the um, one of the talks we did last week, day two daily stand up. If, if it, people want to go watch it, we had Alex Nauda, who's our uh, CTO at Noble Nine, and he actually we had Michael Hausenblaus, who wrote, is writing a fantastic new book called 
um, Cloud Observability in Action. I definitely recommend checking that book out. It has a whole chapter on SLOs. And so we, we spoke with him. We saw Alex Nowder, our CTO, and Alex's talk was, what's the future of open SLO? And this is getting to exactly your question. Like we have this open standard. It's been adopted by you know dozens of organizations. Multiple um, organizations have adopted it as a standard, like you know uh, Sumo Logic and, and others. And what he talked about is this idea of prefabricated SLOs. That the future is going to be all about having out of the box solutions that are open source. They're publicly available, and it's developers sharing with developers how their infrastructure is expected to work. And, and as a, a test study of this, what Alex built is something called EKG. EKG, I think maybe you and I even spoke about it before, but it's the essential Kubernetes gauges. And it's a way to have out-of-the-box SLOs for EK, uh, EKS from Amazon or Kubernetes generally. And it's an example of a prefabricated SLO where you can now not just go and like define all of the criteria, but you can actually look to the community wisdom. You can go to a, a central GitHub repo find SLOs code, import it into your environment, whatever solution you're using that's open SLO compatible. And you can now have SLOs that give you clear reliability targets, performance targets with zero work. And this to me is one of the exciting things. So as we're, you know, we're investing in the AI space and the generative AI because who, you know, you can't not do that. So far, all of the AI work we've done, we've decided to make it free. Most of what we're uh, using upstream is in preview, like Palm 2 and things like that. So we're not willing to charge for that work yet. Um, but the analysis tools and the prefabs and things like this, we're trying to put this into the open source to improve productivity. We want the engineers to focus on running reliable services, not on all the plumbing to measure and manage the metrics pipelines for the reliable services. You want them to focus on cool and new stuff. And that's, to me, this is really, you know, directionally what we're trying to do. We're trying to make it so that less configuration, less setup, less guesswork. Um, and more productivity. I'm directionally, that's where we're going. You can see that like, for the, from these examples, prefabs and um, open uh, examples and uh, generative AI can all support this mission. And then, you know, the debugging tools like the query checker, the metrics health notifier, these other reliability resilience improvements we've made. This means that you can trust the system and make it uh, better. And to your point, this is the day two plus uh, type of world. This is not a oh, experimental, put it in my dev environment. This is like, uh, you know, changing lives in how you manage production, how you do software releases, how you do auto scaling, how you do rollback, how you do incident management, all of this is affected. And so that's where we're really, um, I would say, investing the most of our, our mind share and energy right now is on that topic. Um, we've built a core platform that's great. Now the answer is, you know, the, you know, what do we do to make it so that it's just mind-blowingly easy and to give people that instant business value of, uh, making their engineers more productive so they can go focus on shipping new capabilities. Yeah. Kit, thank you so much for taking time out today. And of course, give us, give us an update about SlowConf. And of course, I would love to chat with you again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Swapdil. Thanks so much for being a media sponsor for SlowConf this year. We really appreciate it. Great talking.